it's just very hard to, to stay consistent, at least for me, uh, when it comes to uh, approach to the game and just approach to to the life itself. I mean, to the you know to the to the general routine. If I was l watching your body language, you turned here and there before you finally made that move. I was knight of three, and then you played g three. Um, it's just a difficult uh, sport. I mean, basically, if you want to break it down, the whole life is difficult, right? So yeah, it's not you know done yet when you need to make a draw sure you can you can fail but i think that is the the easiest of all the challenges out there let's put it this way Hello and welcome to FIDE Grand Prix 2022 i'm Woman Grandmaster Dylan Belenka and today we're joined by Grandmaster from Hungary, Rihard Robert. Uh, Rihard, thank you so much for coming. It has been a pretty long tournament, uh, quite exhausting, I believe. Could you share with us your, your impressions uh, regarding your experience here in Berlin? Uh, yeah, first of all, hi, Dina. Um, yeah, it was very long, you know, uh, especially I think I played many long games. I'm trying to recall, actually, maybe the last, last game was the shortest one that I've played here, which was also the most painful one, obviously. Um, yeah, and I had also the tie breaks, and before that I played in Vacancy, so it feels like a, an eternity being away from home, yeah. And, uh, you know, it's very hard to um, to give, uh, you know, consistent performance, let's put it this way, when you're ch constantly challenged uh, playing uh, the best players out there, or at least, you know, many of them. But do you think it also motivates you, the fact that you are, as you see, being challenged by the best players of such a high level? When you are looking at a time frame, yeah, in short term it can motivate you or it can, you know, let you down. But when you have like, you know, a month of, you know, basically the same routine every day or similar, it, it has both ups and downs. So I guess at times, uh, yeah, it was very interesting. I had uh, even during these tournaments and moments which I felt kind of inspired and I had some moments when, I, you know, I felt, you know, like nothing could have gone worse, but, uh, you know, it still did, yeah, <laughs> afterwards, so it's just very hard to, um, it's just very hard to, to stay consistent, at least for me, uh, when it comes to uh, approach to the game and just approach to, to the life itself, I mean, to the, you know, to the, to the general routine of it all, because basically every chess tournament, at least uh, from my perspective, has this you know, you are going to follow a certain theme, uh, theme and then you just basically, you know, base your day around it, yeah. You're going to come to play to the, not today, I mean, this tournament is three o'clock and every day you come at three and then you just try to wake up, prepare, come, uh, I don't know, get some food in between, get some food after, get some rest and again, it's, uh, yeah, it's kind of draining. Isn't that like also easier that you have uh, some kind of a schedule or discipline? Isn't that helpful in a way to, to like, Go on with life? I guess, you know, it depends on the person, right? I mean, uh, also like outside of chess and like in life in general, right? There are people who feel much more comfortable in an environment where everything is uh, worked up for them and uh, there are people who feel much more comfortable in an environment where, where you know, you kind of make your own rules and uh, you just, um, you are your own boss, let's put it this way, right? So for me, yeah, I, I've certainly, I mean, I have this feeling, I don't know, you know, maybe it will change with time as I, get older, wiser or grumpier or whatever. But yeah, as of now, I just really feel like, you know, it was hard, it is hard to, to be a chess professional in a sense that, you know, um, with all these commitments. And like I said, it's ironic, but the stress level is never the same, right? I mean, you, you, it's kind of built up in you, like everything is the same until you come here. But when you come here, uh, you know, you can have the most brilliant game ever. You can have the uh, preparation turns out to be brilliant and you feel, you know, in the top of the world and you can have also the horrible game uh, with blunders and uh, mistakes and, you know, everything and, um, yeah, then it will have an impact for the future. But uh, at the end of the day, you don't know what's coming in this, I don't know, three to five hours. So you had the situation of a must win against for the save. How do you approach this game psychologically? Yeah, that, that was kind of a... I wouldn't say it was a new situation, but it was kind of an, a rare situation for me because I haven't played, uh, let's say, the World Cup. I think I played once in 2017, which is not, not so recently. And I haven't played the previous Grand Prix cycle either. And yeah, probably I wouldn't have played this one either if I had known in advance that, you know, I'm going to play these two events. So yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, I had this situation where I had to win and it's not, uh, you know, I mean, usually it's 
just for some improvement in the price money, but here it was clearly uh, for qualifying. But um, yeah, it was a bit awkward, you know, because unlike another situ another must win game, when you play with black or with white, like for instance, my, my last game with Hikaru, uh, you kind of know like, okay, uh, Hikaru is aiming for a draw, right? And I'm aiming for a win and one of us will achieve what they want. And okay, if um, if I really fail big time, I will even lose, but that's pretty much it, right? It's not a big, not a big difference. But when I played with, uh, with Vladimir, it was like, um, uh, it wasn't sh entire, for me, it was clear that win is the only result, but also like, um, uh, you know, it might not be enough because there were other factors, meaning that if uh, Wojtaszek uh, would have won um, his game uh, against Oparin, um, it would be meaningless. I mean, I won that game, but uh, it didn't change much in the, in the standings. Um, yeah, however, for him, uh, draw would have been probably a great result knowing the outcome of the Wojtaszek operating game, but, you know, at the time it wasn't clear a draw if, you know, sufficient or he needs to uh, keep pace with Radek and uh, try to win. Yeah, so I kind of tried to use um, all these factors combined uh, during my preparation, which I wouldn't say it was much because I was um, exhausted and also not, uh, you know, too happy with my play until now, so I just more like... Uh, um, thought what should I play that uh, might give me some some chances to counter in case he's ambitious, uh, which he wasn't too ambitious actually, so it kind of backfired. And then, um, uh, yeah, afterwards during the game, I just tried to keep the game going. Uh, and I was really lucky with uh, circumstances that were, you know, out of my control, meaning that uh, operating at a very bad position very early on. Um, however, he didn't lose it. Um, but, you know, and that, I guess, uh, kind of um, uh, changed the psychology a little bit uh, of Vladimir as well throughout the game because he wasn't sure, um, you know, what the outcome of that game will be. Uh, normally, when you are playing uh, white, you know, and uh, you're not so ambitious, um, you can, let's say, force a draw or secure a draw very likely on this level. But, uh, yeah, clearly, um, Oparin was very um, eager to play. And yeah, this was, this little bit backfired. And uh, with this in mind, I felt like I had actually some practical uh, chances, um, which you know turned out to be correct. Yeah. Is trying to play for a draw when draw is enough a good strategy or or not? Uh, you know, I wouldn't mind being in a spot where draw is enough, right? So yeah, I, I guess it has its own challenges and difficulties, but um, so does winning a must-win game. So so does you know making every single move on the board. And um, it's just a difficult uh, sport. I mean, basically, if you want to break it down, the whole life is difficult, right? So, yeah, it's not, you know, done yet when you need to make a draw. Sure, you can, you can fail, but I think that is the, the easiest of all the challenges out there. Let's put it this way. And, um, yeah, like I've said, some people still, uh, you know, don't manage. Some people uh, play uh, uh, just a perfect chess when it's needed. I mean, or... or basically any other sport, right, you know, it could be a football team, like, the, you know, they need to, you know, secure 0-0 zero, zero or whatever and draw and then they do it. Um, you know, it's just, uh, again, it comes down to many small factors, preparation, style, characteristics. For some of us it's uh, easier and some of us it's harder, but at the end of the day I would, I would happily take the challenge. Yeah. Yesterday I was watching um, the start of your game from the upstairs. I was very, um, I was quite surprised uh, how you approached the, the first move. You did take some time, uh, maybe up to one minute, uh, kind of. I was l watching your body language, you turned here and there before you finally made that move. Uh, it was knight of three and then you played g3. I was curious, was it kind of a bluff or being undecisive uh, from your part uh, or putting some extra pressure on your opponent or am I just overthinking it all? Uh, yeah, I usually take, uh, take time to make my first or uh, second, I mean, first two moves. You know, I'm a bit like uh, uh, Maximus Desmos Meridius from Gladiator, right? He was uh, picking up the, the earth before, uh, before any major fight and studying it. Yeah, it's just some, some kind of a stupid habit I picked up. It doesn't really have any, uh, any uh, real meaning. Uh, I mean, it's not like, uh, okay, 90% of the time, it's not like I am thinking what is my first move. Okay, it happened, but you know, that is a kind of, uh, kind of an uh, amateur thing to, do, thing to do, right? So it's more like I just, you know, get settled into it and, you know, yeah, it usually takes like one minute, sometimes a bit more, sometimes a bit less. Yeah.
jumping on another subject, willing to, to learn more of you. How did it all start? How did chess come to your life? In, at one point uh, in Hungarian media, um, when I was still you know, young and ambitious, and uh, it, it went around the place. Uh, it, what happened is that um, I, I kind of you know, got to know the game very early on, like I, I, I guess or I hope like if I have a, one day a child or children, I would also teach them, you know, many of these uh, edu educationally oriented board games, let's put it this way. So I also learned chess, like, I think, around four or five years old. Um, and, and, you know, it was one of the games, and, you know, I was kind of, uh, let's put it this way, I had a nice chat with, this, uh, you know, my parents spent a lot of time with me, and they were kind of young parents as well. So, um, yeah, and then I was playing lots of games, and that was it pretty much. Uh, and then at one point, uh, when I was going to school already, right, and I was in second grade. Um, in elementary, I was in second grade, and um, I was pretty good at math. And um, I was always getting, you know, A. I think in Hungarian it's called five, but okay, I don't know. It's, it's different for all of us. So I was always getting A in math, and uh, pretty much, you know, without any uh, error, errors or mistakes. And one day I got like a, like a B, right, like a four. And um, yeah, and what happened is that there was a, you know, there was a paper and I was supposed to, you know, flip it to turn it around, and there was more um, exercises on the other side, right? Because, you know, our, our school system is very poor, obviously, so they couldn't afford to have two papers, right? They had to print it on both sides. Yeah, and, um, well, I didn't do that, right? So I was very happily filling out the first half perfectly fine, and then I was like, okay, it's done. And then, it, you know, it comes like empty, empty, empty. So I got like a B, and my father was like, okay, it's clearly due to lack of focus uh, rather than, you know, uh, just being completely dumb, which I was. It's due to lack of focus, and um, what can we do to improve your focus? Because, you know, school is very important and, and everything. And then, yeah, chess uh, came in as a, as a solution. I mean, not really a solution in the beginning, but like just to, you know, I have to go to chess, I have to, you know, uh, get into some workshops or whatever. And then, yeah, they, they just real kind of figured or discovered that I could be talented, and, you know, I was like, a, I think I was like nine or ten when I played my first tournament, which, um, yeah, I think is like kind of late uh, when it strictly come to becoming a chess professional. But yeah, that's how it was for me. So, and here I am. Where was the turning point uh, in your life when you switched to the profession, to, to chess being your profession, being professional chess player, chess player, or did it just become naturally? I kind of think about it um, a lot uh, just because of like what uh, would I have done differently if I was in my parents' uh, shoes or what would I do, let's say, one day if, you know, I am a parent actually. And because, you know, like um, I became Grandmaster, I think, uh, at 14 or maybe just before 14. So already at that time, kind of you, it's kind of given, right, that you should be just professional. Um, but like I was still a child, right? So if someone tells you, okay, there is this game, what you are really good at, um, and you can make a living with it, and you can play it for the rest of your life. Okay, it's like, I don't know, someone tells you, you can go to school and, and study for the classes, or you can just eat candy and play games all the day. I mean, which one do you choose? Of course, as a child, you choose the latter, right? So I, I kind of um, chose chess uh, without knowing, you know, all the pitfalls and all of it um, about it, and, you know, feel so nice and more like an adult. I'm not sure if I was, uh, I was to make this decision, but it's, ship has kind of sailed, right? So, um, you know, here I am. Yeah, I guess, like I've said, thanks to sort of a rapid development uh, in, of my level of play at a young age, it, uh, it was just decided uh, on the way yeah, by my parents, um, which, you know, sometimes, uh, I mean, most of the times, I'm not too happy with this uh, outcome. But okay, this is um, my life as of right now, yeah. You have had a very unique chance of playing at the same team uh, together with the legendary Judith Polgar. Also, you might have had a chance to be playing under her patronage as well. Could you share with us uh, this kind of experience if, if there was something in particular that you managed to learn from her? Yeah, you know, the thing is uh, that I, uh, funnily, I haven't really worked with anyone out of our uh, top three players because we had this generation like Leko, uh, Polgar and Almashi, right? They were pretty much the same age and they were uh, kind of, you know, making our, our national team extremely strong uh, from the late 90s, I think, uh, until basically Tromso. 
And yeah, somehow I haven't uh, really worked with, with any of them, right? Which is a real shame and uh, missed the opportunity, obviously. But it's, um, yeah, our mentality as a country and as people somehow was never really, you know, it was not really like uh, such a team, uh, you know, oriented, uh, let's put it this way, approach. We are more like individual players. At least I had this feeling, individual players who come together and we respect each other very much. And obviously, or, or let's say they played more together than I played with them. And obviously they respect each other very much and they want to give their best. Uh, and as a team, they are supporting you know, each other. But when it comes down to it, yeah, at the end of the day, uh, they rather work with people whom you know, they did work with, I guess, than, than each other. Or if someone uh, even was um, you know, um, proposing it, then obviously the other party wasn't uh, so much for it. So as it comes down to me, no, I, I unfortunately didn't. And, also, like uh, it was very, it would have been, you know, very awkward just to ask because I, I don't uh, feel like it's, uh, it's in my place or whatever. You know, I, I feel like, you know, at that at that point in time when uh, she was still active, I was clearly uh, a much uh, worse player. So it would have only uh, be beneficial for me. And um, she's such a legend. And then now already, of course, she's not in uh, in chess for a while. So again, you know, the tables have turned, and I don't think it would. Uh, change uh, too much, at least not uh, objectively, maybe uh, it could uh, make an impact, uh, like she has huge experience and psychologically, but this uh, goes for with, with, uh, with all uh, legends, right, of the past, so they are still making, uh, you know, an impact. Yeah. I was wondering, do you see yourself in, in any future working with somebody, having like a team or a second, uh, someone you would be, uh, um, you could rely on? Not really. I mean, yeah, I, I actually was uh, once uh, seconding uh, a friend of mine, Laurent Fresnay. It was uh, a long, long time ago. I was 17, so, oof, okay. Yeah, previous decade. So, yeah, it was a long time ago, and I, I actually had a really uh, good time uh, helping with him, and then he helped me later on also for one tournament at that time. But, yeah, since uh, I moved to, to, to Belgrade, and since, uh, you know, uh, I got married and everything, uh, basically, uh, already for some time now, I just uh, kind of, you know, it was kind of deliberate, but also kind of given, I don't know, it's a bit of both, um, to, to just end, end, end up working uh, on chess mostly alone, right? I mean, it's not like I would not prefer to have someone, you know, when I am, uh, you know, sleeping, uh, burning down an engine or, you know, changing laptops between the rounds and uh, telling me I play this against this guy. And uh, it's not like also that, you know, uh, that is bad. It's just, uh, I, as you would say on Valentine's Day, on this matter, I didn't find the right person yet, probably, or something, yeah? But, um, you know, um, when it comes to relationships, uh, I mean, work relationships inside of chess, I, uh, from my understanding, I'm, I, I, it doesn't really go with me. I mean, the people's uh, psyche or whatever. I feel like, you know, uh, because it's also a lot of, very important, of course, if the person whom you are uh, trying to, to build a, a work relationship with, right, if you respect him or her as a, as a worker, right, as, as just purely when it comes down to, to chess qualities, I mean, uh, you can have the best friend, but if he's not up to the task of what's at hand, I mean, what's the point, right? But also, uh, I can, it can be reversed, right? That you need to trust the person, you need to have respect uh, for him or her as it comes down to character. And yeah, all the people somehow whom are, you know, uh, whom I feel toward this, both of these things uh, somehow have been taken, or maybe not too surprisingly, right? Because, you know, other people also saw their value and qualities. And other than that, I didn't uh, feel like it. So yeah, and you know, as time passed and as uh, you know, my results uh, improved or, or progressed, I obviously got used to this and I got very comfortable with uh, you know, doing things uh, this way. And also, you know, I have huge support from my, my wife and of course she could also um, you know, uh, tell me, okay, you're going to play worse but because you don't have a team and everything, but uh, she just uh, stands by me in a way and accepts uh, even if you know my decisions seem uh, crazy at first or you know insane, so yeah, all, all, all over I, I feel like I'm in a very uh, good place, even like this. And um, making a, a major change, um, you know, uh, could be better, but also could be worse. And I don't feel like making changes, uh, you know, in a way when nothing uh, indicates, except what people say, right? That people have seconds and coaches and they say it, but I don't see it in my own experience. That is so important. So, like, if it's a big mistake that I'm making with this, I feel like you know it's it's my time to make it. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, 
my term to make it, you know what to say. Do you have some passions, uh, hobbies outside chess? Yeah, I am actually very boring, so I'm thinking to give some good answer. Obviously, uh, being married is my passion and my hobby, right? It's a full-time full -time job. Um, other than that, um, yeah, I don't know. Like, I like to, you know, go to cinemas. I like to go out, uh, you know, with friends, uh, socializing. Let's put this way, at least at home, uh, when it's not, uh, you know, pure uh, work. Uh, also, like to go for walks, you know, and stuff. Uh, I don't know, shopping. I have to go to get a present, even now, uh, and things like this. So yeah, but these are nothing, you know, extraordinary. Yeah? I mean, I, I don't, you know, feel like if I would tell you, like. Uh, I don't know, I like climbing mountains and you'll be like, wow, this is crazy. No, I don't have anything like that. I just, you know, live a really uh, normal life in, in this sense. I kept the privilege, you know, to not to have a daytime job. This is really the only thing that I like about being a chess professional, um, that you ha actually uh, have your, uh, your schedule, uh, you know, to yourself. So, like, I can wake up at, uh, at noon and, you know, nothing really is ruined, whether, you know, if you had a job and you have to go there at 9 a.m., Waking up at noon might have some some consequences, which is not there with me. So I can really freely uh, meet people, um, arrange my day, not to look at chess for a week, uh, go for a vacation whenever it's convenient. Yeah, so this uh, gives me makes me very flexible in this sense. But other than that, I don't have any crazy passions or hobbies or something. What would be an ideal rest day for you? Yeah, just probably just 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 resting. Yeah, then. Like just uh, you know doing nothing. I, I really actually, at least when I have a tournament, uh, it becomes so draining. You know, like whenever I had rest day when I was younger, and you know the fire was still burning, right? I was always like, okay, it's another day to prepare. You know, like uh, maybe now I will learn or I will figure some idea, like you know, what I couldn't have done on time if I didn't have this extra 24 hours. But now I'm mostly like, okay, there is 24 hours. Um, I will sleep longer. I will go to a nice lunch, okay, I can actually eat my food because there is no stress, you know. Um, I will have a coffee afterwards or tea or whatever, a dessert, and I will go back to bed and probably just, you know, sleep soon, sleep early as possible and that's it, yeah. Would, sh uh, would going outside be a necessary thing or you could just lock yourself inside? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, it's very hard to... to um, it depends where you are, I guess. Because, okay, there are some really inspiring places in the world and you know when it's, uh, I don't know, minus uh, 10 degrees and the winds, I mean, you don't really want to go outside, right? Uh, uh, especially when it's, you know, with this uh, COVID situation, yeah, and everywhere they're asking for, you know, all kinds of uh, privileged uh, things just to let you enter to, to, let's say, pubs and restaurants and whatever. So it's kind of like, as of today, I'm perfectly fine being... Uh, by myself, of course, I prefer to have company. So, like, ideally, I, I would uh, spend time with uh, friends or with my wife, mostly, right? Um, uh, after all, okay, she's like my best friend, so basically, <laughs> yeah. But um, at, at the end of the day, okay, if I'm alone, I'm alone. Yeah, what to do? You mentioned uh, having some some great, some good lunch, uh, tea or coffee, and dessert. My question was, so tea or coffee? I think it's mostly coffee, but. Yeah, I use, it used to be tea, but as, as you know, time changes, I, I get lazier to make it, yeah. It's much easier to make coffee somehow, uh, at home at least. And then when I go to a restaurant, I'm already like expecting the coffee, so I would go with coffee, yeah. What are three particular things that you would not imagine your life without? Uh, I guess one should be my wife, because she'll watch this, also otherwise. Okay. Uh, uh, other two, I don't know. Honestly, I don't really um, hold on to stuff too much. So, um, computer? No, not really, because you know the thing is that uh, if I wouldn't have a computer, I would read more books, right? And if I would uh, read my books, probably I would be, you know, feeling more fulfilled, right? Say, so I feel like many of these things are just unnecessary distractions. Not uh -huh. even chase base? No, because you know, like also for me, like I could easily imagine my life not playing chess as well, right? And because of this, like, yeah, sure, as a chess professional, it would be really annoying everyone, you know, having fouls and chess base and me not, right? I mean, that would be kind of a, kind of a huge handicap right there. But um, just if you want to live in a you know, flexible world, right? If you would tell me, okay, you cannot play chess anymore, I would probably find another, prof I would probably, you know, get another job. Maybe it wouldn't, you know, pay me as well. Maybe it would uh, not be easy to adjust. But eventually I feel like I would make an adjustment and uh, I would be, Similar, uh, similarly, you know, situated in, uh, in the world as I am now, just with different, you know, surroundings.
Is there some historical period, epoch from the past that you would like to 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 have a chance to to be? Ah, you mean like uh, historic, like uh, okay, maybe yes. Uh, I think actually many, yeah, right? Like the more I, I mean, I, I I generally like history a lot, but also like as a just professional, like I have the feeling that let's say the, uh, the times around Fisher, so like 70s, 80s, even 90s with the with the matches between Kasparov and Karpov, uh, all these times were just very good, uh, or at least uh, much more different. And I feel like it would uh, fit me or suit me better uh, as of today's chess. You know, uh, with these tournaments forever, okay, that would be a bit tricky, like to have this 23 rounds event or something, and you are there for you know a decade in one place. But on the other hand, chess generally had a, a much higher standard. Uh, I mean, I live in Belgrade, you know, uh, there was this Invest uh, Banka tournaments, yeah, which filled uh, theaters of you know thousands of people, and they were coming to watch uh, the games. And uh, you know, what's ridiculous that they even understood what was going on, right? I mean, it's uh, and today. Uh, okay, or at least you know they were curious enough to 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 wait and to hunt uh, grandmasters down to explain to them. And as of today, you know, with this information and uh, computer and artificial intelligence, how everything is uh, is uh, progressing so quickly, right? Uh, uh, you can be the most uh, brilliant uh, player at chess, not at everything else, because if it comes to physical sports or something, you see the numbers, you see the results, you see that. Um, how, let's say, Cristiano Ronaldo is kicking a penalty and how he's scoring, and you say, okay, this is amazing, right? I understand what he's doing, but I have no way of replicating it. I have no way of, you know, explaining exactly how he uh, holds his foot, how much he's working a day, right? But when it comes to chess, unfortunately, you just go to, you know, chess server, you see a bar right there for you, right? You are very smart with the bar immediately, you immediately know what's going on, and you see, okay, uh, why is that that the knight, you know, has to go that square? And not to the other one. And to you, it's very obvious, right? And you kind of lose respect um, unconsciously. You really lose respect because I try to explain to yourself. I see this; it's out there. I mean, anyone else can see it. Really, I'm not, you know, a genius by seeing it. So, I should lie to myself. It's actually very hard to spot it during the game when it's just given to me for free. So, it's basically speaking. I think people generally lose respect and understanding uh, for being, you know, uh, an elite chess player or chess player. How draining it is and why we make so many mistakes or why we make so few mistakes and you know compared to others let's say right um, so yeah I think uh, that those times were better but when it comes down to you know uh, historic periods in time as a non-chess player um, yeah I don't know I, I would like to be in many uh, interesting places you know uh, uh, interesting times maybe you know I would die young but who cares right so uh, it was different times yeah and certainly I feel like uh, to my personality, some of those times would uh, suit better, but as long as uh, no viewer has a time machine, I think we shouldn't uh, investigate this further. Yeah. Would you, if I ask you an advice of a film, to recommend uh, to me for an evening, what would that be? No, I, I, my favorite uh, film, I have quite a few favorites, but maybe my all-time favorite should be The Matrix. Yeah? I really like uh, The Matrix, also like Casablanca very much, which is a completely different uh, genre and completely different just altogether. So like uh, depending on, I guess, on your personality, I would recommend uh, one or the other. Yeah. Who are, let's say, two famous people, a male and a female, that you would like in particular to have a, a dinner with? I have no idea. <laughs> I have to think, uh, really, uh, there are so many people actually. I would like to, you know, I have admired, you know, lots of athletes, lots of uh, leaders of the past, uh, lots of inventors, you know, whatever. Um, so, like to pick two um, of any time, yeah. And I have so many questions, let's say, and so many uh, topics. Uh, it would be, again, just hypothetically interesting to discuss, right? Um, but at the end of the day, to pick two, right, it would be really hard, also, like, um, um, I don't really see. Uh, myself at what uh, situation am I in, right? Like, for instance, uh, you know, am I today uh, doing this dinner, right? If I do it today, like uh, with my today's uh, mindset, probably I would pick different people and different uh, topics and everything than if I have done it, you know, yesterday or if I do it a year from now. And since, you know, uh, it would certainly be very impactful, I cannot just uh, name them, yeah. Plus, on the other hand, you know, it's just a dinner, right? Yeah. I mean, not much is happening, so. Why not to have it with your loved ones, you know, like uh, why to waste time on you're not going to, you know, take anything back from it, right? So it's not like 
I say, you know, someone from the Rothschild family, and I come home with, you know, five buildings next to each other, yeah, <laughs> and next to my name. No, I, I, I don't feel like uh, that's the case, right? So it's just the experience. And as, as much as it comes to uh, anyone's uh, personality, whatever makes them happy should be the key of making choices, right? So why would, uh, let's say, it make uh, me crucially happier to, to have a dinner with someone whom I admire, however, still a stranger, than, uh, you know, uh, someone whom I just simply know, but, you know, I also love, right? Could you describe your native city in five different words? Oh, my native city, actually, it's, it's already tricky. I was born in, uh, in Sambathai, which is in, uh, next to the border with Austria. But actually, I haven't lived there all that much. So I was, my family was moving around. I lived in Budapest for some time, then uh, in Schopfrom, which is actually, again, next to Austria, but from a different angle. And then in, next to, in Sombat Hill, and then I moved to, to Belgrade. And somehow it divides equally all of this uh, time right. spent in my life. So like, I could describe any of these places if you like. Yeah. Uh, let's say um, Budapest. OK. Yeah, there I actually uh, live the list, but I like it very much. So, you know, I always have this, um, this, this thought in my mind, right, when it comes to comparing, because a lot of people ask me uh, to compare Belgrade and Budapest, um, since they're both capitals, they start, both uh, start with a B, right? And also, like, I've lived in both places, uh, just to compare them, like, okay, what I prefer. And I always feel like, you know, Budapest has a, Budapest, as we say, has a much nicer um, architecture. I mean, just, you know, it's uh, really breathtaking. And, and, you know, if you are a foreigner and you like to go there, I mean, you like to move to, let's say, somewhere outside, I feel like it's very um, affordable. And yet, you know, the, the standard of living is kind of decent. However, you know, I personally, yeah, because I'm, I live in Serbia for so long now, and it's not, you know, no one puts a gun next to my head. Yeah, I chose it. However, I always feel like when it comes to Belgrade, maybe the architecture is not uh, that great also. Okay, obviously, unfortunately, there, they had a war, right? And uh, some things uh, still, uh, you know, paying the price for that. But uh, I just feel like the people are just, you know, so nice that they make up all for it, and uh, especially towards, you know, general foreigners, right? So, like, I could, if I could make the ideal uh, capital or city, right, to, I would swap, you know, the people, and I would keep the architecture, right? So. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, so it's very hard for me to, to pick one, which one I love better. But um, yeah, I'm happy where I am right now, so I, I recommend uh, Belgrade. But also Budapest is really nice. It just depends what you are looking for, right? So basically, you would just uh, take all the Serbians and put them to, to Budapest? Yeah, but it's, uh, it seemingly would require some military action, so don't... Uh, <laughs> you didn't hear it from me, you know? <laughs> okay, better not to try, but in, in some ideal world, right? Yeah, it's no, I... Fiction. Yeah, I, you know, the thing is that uh, our culture in Hungary, um, whatever people say, uh, okay, this is my uh, experience, let's put it this way, is not too open towards foreigners. And uh, as ironically or, you know, logically, our language is so messed up, right? Like, uh, you can't really... Um, compare it or you can't really, you know, catch a word here and there uh, from it as, as a non-native. Non and uh, because of this, we don't, uh, I mean, not we, like most Hungarians, let's say, like, are not really um, welcoming. Maybe it changes with younger generations, but uh, when it comes to older people, uh, they're not really for welcoming and they don't really speak any other language. So, for instance, uh, when I spent some time with my wife in Budapest, it's really tricky for her, right? Uh, uh, towards, uh, let's say, me, Serbian people are very welcoming and they are always like, ah, okay, where are you from, you know, and I speak some Serbian, but of course my Serbian is, uh, is very bad, very broke, and uh, they still are like, you know, completely fine with it. Why, when it comes to, and they try to speak English themselves, right, just to, you know, find a common, uh, common language, common tongue. While when it comes to Hungarians, right, they, they, they speak English or they speak German or whatever other language, is required, and yet they, they just pretend not to, and they understand, uh, you know, and they talk you out behind your back, and uh, whenever, you know, uh, warn, I warn you now, if you ask him for a direction in Budapest because you are lost, they might send you to the opposite, right? This is just, uh, and they feel very good about themselves while doing so. So this is just something that is uh, in their culture, and, you know, as a native, of course, you can like Budapest, but uh, if, you know, I look as, you know, from uh, the, the eyes of, you know, being a you know, married person, I have to look out for, you know, my wife as well in this matter. I, I, I would prefer, you know, Belgrade to it, yeah. 
Richard, that has been extremely inspiring to have a chance to be talking to you. I really appreciate you, you haven't taken that time. And uh, I do want to wish you a good rest, even though you won't have uh, so much time before Belgrade. And of course, lots of luck in Belgrade. Once again, thank you so much. Sure. Thank you.